Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus. Our guest in this edition is Matthias Matt Gutman. He's a U.S. Navy veteran of World War II. Gutman served in the Pacific Theater and achieved the rank of Chief Petty Officer during his 22 years in the Navy. Gutman served aboard LST-553 and was coxswain during several important missions, including the beach landings at the battles of Peleliu and Okinawa. Matt Gutman was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and he's very proud to come from a military family. He describes here how he joined the Navy and rose through the ranks. I was born in Allentown on January 26, 1925. I have two brothers that were in the service prior to World War II. One was in the Navy and the other was in the Army. And after when the war started, of course, I was the youngest out of both of them. And then I came along and the war was on. I was in, uh, I was in my, I was in high school and I was 16 years old when I heard they dropped the bond at Pearl Harbor. And when I was 18, naturally I had a register for the draft. Well, two months later, I got notice from the draft board that I was classified 1A, which meant that most any day they'd call me. And I knew this. And I went immediately to the Navy recruiting and enlisted for six years to avoid being drafted in the Army or Marines. I wanted to be a Navy man. When you're first as a seaman and you go on board ship, you start out from the bottom as a recruit. And I was on the deck division. And there, they taught us everything about the Navy, the Navy language, and it was altogether different. And uh, you work your way up the ladder. And then I became a coxswain. That is the man that operates and is in charge of that boat. Anybody that ha- is in charge of a small boat in the Navy is called a coxswain. Now, there's a rating of coxswain. When you go up four levels, then you're a coxswain. Now they're, cursed, now they're third class. They're called third class. Back then, we were coxswains. That's the way that came about. I was sent to Evansville, Indiana to pick up our ship. And the ship was called LST-553. That meant landing ship tank. And all amphibious ships at that time didn't have names. They only went by the, the numbers. And uh, I boarded that ship then at Evansville, Indiana. It was, it was built there right alongside the Ohio River. Well, when we boarded that ship, we noticed that the whole ship was camouflaged, tropical colors. Ah, oh, about a day or two later, we got together with the crew members and boy, this ship is bound for the Pacific because it was uh, had tropical colors. We knew then that we're, that ship's going to go to the Pacific Theater. And that's how I wind up on that ship. Eventually, when you become, I was a chief, then I was chief, I'm a chief boatswain's mate now. Mm-hmm. That is the leading man on the ship as a boatswain. Chief, and a chief boatswain, that's really up there. Because all you're doing then you're showing leadership, you're explaining everything to them, how to do the job properly. And that's the way we work ourselves up. We got to the Pacific. We left San Diego, went to Pearl Harbor. We seen what the destruction was there. And we, we went on a large convoy. We passed the equator, went down to the Solomon Islands. And we trained there with the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal. They already had Guadalcanal was secured. We were there to be taught how to land, uh, how to take care of their tra- tanks, because that's what our ship was. Our ship was meant for two things. LST, landing ship tank. It carried about 250 combat soldiers and 20 tanks. Gutman's first major landing was at Peleliu in September 1944. 
He describes bringing American seamen ashore under Japanese fire. I was on my small landing craft. Our ship carried two landing crafts, one the starboard side and one the port side. I was in charge of the port side. Uh, what happens is they lower the boat to the water and they tie it up. And the Marines or combat soldiers come down a cargo net into the boat. And once the boat is filled, we carry 35 combat soldiers in there, plus our four sailors. And then once they're all loaded, we go in a large circle until the first wave is all together, until we all get, and then we'll all divide up and go into the wave, first wave, second wave, and third wave to invade an island. Telelo was surrounded by reefs, most of the island. When I had my boat loaded with combat marines, I could go over these reefs with the boat. So we transferred the troops into LVTs. LVTs is a landing vehicle track. That was a slow-moving amphibious. It could go in the water, it could climb over reefs, and also on land, LVTs. And that was the fiercest battle I was in. I was in the third wave, bringing in troops. In my six years of the landings, that was the worst. When we get there, our fleet is already there. I'm thinking, I mean the fleet, the big battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. They are pounding that island with their big guns to soften up that island. As we arrive, our ship then unloads the troops and into my landing craft. And like I said, we can get together and then we'll all go in. I went into the third wave now. As we're approaching, we're already engaged in getting artillery fire coming out at us. And as we get closer to the landing, you're getting mortar fire. And once you land, you're getting machine gun fire. Well, my boat, and we were instructed when we land, go full speed so that your boat digs into the sand so that you don't broach the boat. Because if you broach the boat, went sideways, you're not gonna get out of there, that's it, you're finished. Because the next wave will keep you, you can't get out because you're ready, your propeller's in the, in the sand, you know you can't do a movement. Well, after I hit that beach full speed, we lowered the front ramp and the 35 Marines start storming up the beach. They're encountering machine gun fire and mortar fire. Plenty of them young guys got killed immediately, and a lot got wounded. That's part of the invasion. Now, when our big guns stop firing, that's when they, 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 they invade. Now, they are being protected by our airplanes coming down and softening up them and bombing and strafing the Japanese to give them a little beach, you know, advancement. Once the Marines advance, then our ship beaches. The ship opens its big bow doors, ramp comes down, and off roll the tanks to support the Marines that are, make, are making advancement. That's what transpires in an invasion. Well, I'm responsible in just holding that boat where it is. One of my sailors, a seaman, he drops the ramp. As soon as we hit the beach, I order him to drop the ramp, and he drops it. And then off they, off they scamper up that beach. Fully loaded, you know, and my God. They're all young guys, just like we were. 18 and a half, 19 year old guys. 
The Battle of Peleliu was not the last time Matt Gutman would see action in the Pacific Theater. We will pick up his story after a quick break. I'm Greg Columbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus. Our guest in this edition is retired U.S. Navy Chief Petty Officer Matthias Matt Gutman. Earlier, Gutman described the landing at the Battle of Peleliu. Once his LST landed and the troops and vehicles were deployed, the boat had to turn around and head back to the main ship. It's a process that Gutman says was quite complicated. Right as the battleships stop, we're, we're uh, attacked by some of their planes. And, uh, of course, all the artillery coming out as we're forming. And that's the only thing we encountered. Of course, then it was very severe once we hit the beach. Since we dug up into the sand pretty properly so we don't broach the boat, I had to wait until the next wave came in. It lifted the boat up the, the, the after part of the boat, and then I gunned it real fast in reverse. And I made sure I went all the way back pretty fast, and I was able to turn it around before the next wave came in. That's how you got away. What happened is, uh, when, when they were there, and a lot of them got wounded, uh, I had to take them back to the hospital ships and back and, f- and come back with other type of supplies. We were supposed to take that island within three days because the island was only six miles long and two miles wide. But why we wanted that island is because the Japanese had an airstrip on there. And that would help us from jumping, jumping to different islands and for our air force to get up closer. And that's why we invaded Peleliu. That's a small island. We were supposed to conquer that island in three days. It took us 24 days. Why? The Japanese were all hiding in tunnels throughout that whole island. And they only come out when it's an advantage to them. And that's how it took so long. After Peleliu, Gutman served in the Battle of Leyte and Mindoro. Leyte was the first time Gutman encountered the deadly kamikaze pilots of the Japanese. Now, we are then preparing for the next invasion. That was Leyte. That was my next one in the Philippines. Let me tell you this. The first thing we encountered when we invaded Leyte, the first time we experienced kamikaze pilots. They were there to dive on our ships, and they did. They did a good job. Our planes shot down three of them. They never hit us. They got close, but never hit us. We were lucky there. While this was going on, our fleet was battling the Japanese fleet in Saraga, San Bino Straits, in the, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the Gulf. That lasted for two days, or maybe a little longer, I'm not sure, because they were quite a few distance away from us. Because our fleet intercepted that fleet before it came through to, to uh, Leyte. Had that ships come through, and we only had any aircraft guns, they had these big guns. They would have crushed us. Never happened because our ship inter- intercepted their ships. And that sea battle, we came out as victors. Their fleet after that was decimated. I don't know how many, or how many ships they sunk, but a lot of ships they fled, a lot of Japanese fled away then because they know they were losing the battle. But from there on in, their fleet was nothing, really. And well, they finally conquered Leyte, like I said, in 24 days. Now we left. We regrouped for our next one. Our next landing was Mindoro in the Philippines. That wasn't that severe. That was pretty easy. Then we went to Lane Gulf in the Philippines. And the fourth one, 
as it was a Subic Bay in the Isle of Luzon. That was the four in landings we made in the, in the Philippines. After that, we went back to uh, uh, Pelilo, and we, we, we got together and loaded our ship up again to our next invasion. They never told us in advance where we're going until we're way out at sea and then they let us know. Now we're on our way to invade Okinawa. When we come back, we will continue the story of Matt Gutman at the invasion of Okinawa. I'm Greg Columbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus. In the spring of 1945, at the island of Peleliu, Coxswain Matthias Matt Gutman was informed he would be participating in the invasion of Okinawa. On Easter morning that year, the invasion began. Gutman told us how the Japanese used very different tactics at the start of this battle and how the conditions became extraordinarily brutal. This invasion would play a critical role in final victory in the Pacific. In this part of the conversation, Gutman describes the Battle of Okinawa, the news of the atomic bombings over Japan, and the jubilation among the troops after finding out they would finally be heading home. We invaded Okinawa on Easter Sunday morning, April the 1st, 1945. That was the biggest battle in the Pacific, biggest invasion. That island was 73 miles long and about eight miles wide. It was 300 miles, I believe, about west of Japan, very close. The Japanese really knew that that would be our their big their biggest battle, the last one. Well, after I landed the troops, I was in the first wave. Guess what? Not anything come on us, any firepower. As we were approaching it, no artillery, no mortar fire, no machine gun fire. They left all our troops land, all these different waves. And we wondered, what strategy is this? We never experienced anything like this. Guess what? They all were hidden underground in their tunnels. Like I said, 73 miles. They had tunnels throughout that whole island. After our troops landed, the very next day, all hell broke loose. They come out of the tunnels. Well, our Marines that I landed, there was two beaches, White Beach number one, White Beach number two. I landed at White Beach number two. Not like I said, no firepower, nothing. Our troops that I landed were Marines, and they secured the northern part of that very quickly. And they start going south, pushing themselves, advancing. While they were advancing, we heard and our admirals and our generals heard that a lot of Okinawa civilians were getting killed by crossfire. Then we were dispatched, our ship was dispatched and ordered to go down to the southern islands, the southern end of the island, to evacuate a lot of civilians. While our skipper beached the ship and we loaded the whole, t our, our tanks were already off. We loaded that whole tank deck with civilians, women, children, older men. We must have carried a thousand of them in there. They didn't have no time to sit, they had to stand. We then transported them all the way up the northern end and left them off because that was in the Marines' hands already. Or the soldiers and Marines, a combination of both. And that's when we left them off. The Japanese told a lot of civilians 
that we were monsters, we were going to rape their women, that they should commit suicide. And they did. A lot of those women and children jumped off their cliffs and killed themselves. In fact, some of the Japanese gave them hand grenades to kill themselves. All a bunch of rumors, lies. Well, it took us close to three months to conquer that island. That was the biggest and fiercest battle in the Pacific. The Navy took a beating there. About 5,000 sailors were killed from kamikaze planes. And for another 5,000 were wounded. That's just the Navy. Now, the Army and Marines, they, they lost a lot there. I don't know what the figure was there. But the battle had ended, and then we went to, back to the Philippines, to Buckner Bay. While we were at Buckner Bay on our way, we found out that our Air Force dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The Japanese didn't surrender then. And you know, it killed the close to 70,000 of their civilians. Ah, so they dropped the second bomb on Nagasaki. Killed the same amount of people. The Japanese finally then surrendered on August 14. They had enough. Now, we were there. We were gearing up to invade Japan itself. And that would have been on November the 1st. Never happened because the Japanese surrendered. It was in November. Now, whether it was the 1st, but it was early November. We were told it would be November 1st. Never happened. It was estimated if we had invaded that island, we'd have lost a million men because the civilians and everybody would fighting us, defend their country. Naturally, that's what would take place. It never happened. Now, there's a lot of controversy about that dropping the bomb. They blame Truman and everything else. But we as military men, believe me, that was the best thing he did. That stopped the war. So it ended. And that was on August 14th when they surrendered. On September the 2nd, officially it ended on the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay, where our allies, us and the Japanese, finally unconditional surrender. September 2nd, 1945, officially ended, and that was called VJ Day. Boy, we were so happy. Uh, now we said to ourselves, my God, you know, Tomorrow we ain't going to go in a battle. We're going to be sent home. We're going to probably see our sweetheart girlfriends, get married, you know, and enjoy life. That was in my mind. And we were all so happy. After the Japanese surrender, Gutman remained in the Navy as a minesweeper and on the island of Okinawa. It was also on this assignment that Gutman procured a samurai sword from a Japanese officer. Since I was a six-year enlisted man, I wasn't sent home. There was a lot sent home right away. Those that were drafted, uh, a lot of military, they didn't military. They didn't need any military anymore, right? I still had two and a half years remaining on my six-year enlistment. I stayed on that ship. That ship then was ordered to sweet pressure mines in Japan so our ships could use that going into their harbors. Pressure mines were dropped by our airplanes in the harbors to stop their shipping going in and out. Now they call it pressure mines for one reason. When a ship, the pressure mines that were dropped will sink to the bottom. They lay there. They're not these floating mines. They're laying in the bottom. As soon as the ship gets directly over that bomb, it explodes. Now, the war was over. 
28 of us volunteered for that duty. The war's over. Who the heck at 18 stupid would volunteer? The war's over, and we didn't get killed during the war. Now we're, we're hanging out there, and our lives are on the line, and we did that for 60 days. And orders, we call them sweeping. Sweeping was when our ship, every 100 yards, went back and forth six times to cover that whole harbor, to detect if there's a live mine, and it would explode. We never encountered any of them, to our blessing. Now, we wondered why. Well, they might have exploded before, or maybe seawater made them inoperable. I don't know. We never found out. But we were happy we never hit one. <laughs> That's why I'm here today. <laughs> and now that was over. The next duty we had was to disarm the Japanese on a few islands in around Okinawa. That's where I got the samurai sword, and I'll tell you how that happened. They knew that we were coming there to disarm them because the war was over, and they knew it ahead of time. Well, I was on a land party with them to disarm them. I went ashore with them, and we instructed them to bring all their guns, ammunition, and, uh, explosives down to the beach. They did. While it was there, we had them load their guns and ammunition on their big wooden boats. Four of the Japanese soldiers were on there with my crew, and I piloted that boat out to sea four or five miles and had these Japanese throw all this stuff into the water while I was still traveling. I didn't just sit there, you know, disperse everything. On the way back, I made a couple trips. On the way back on one of my trips, I happened to see this Japanese soldier come down the road with four other Japanese, and he was wearing a samurai sword. And since we were there to disarm him, oh, I quickly went over to him and said, and I said in English, Sir, you won't need this anymore. And I unbuckled it from his belt, and I brought it home. During his time with us, Gutman also described what made him the most proud when looking back at his service. Well, I was proud that I had the opportunity to serve my country. We were at war, and I wanted to join that war to defeat the enemy so that we could expect our freedom back again. That, that was most upper bar in my mind. And to come back home was a blessing because out there, I already, going from one invasion to the next, next one, I thought to myself, and it was ingrained in myself, that I probably would never see home. And I resolved myself to that fact. I'll never see home. Well, it went the other way around. I came, I survived. Yes. And I was so happy to come home. Matthias Matt Gutman, retired U.S. Navy Chief Petty Officer, who served as a coxswain in the Pacific Theater of World War II. His LST made landings at Peleliu, Okinawa, and many other locations in the Pacific. I'm Greg Columbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, we're at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.